In 2015, a man got up on stage and tried to tell the world about an upcoming epidemic. He warned people that the next epidemic might be flu related. He claimed that it could be transmitted but in the air rather than by being people touching each other so much and also in such a way that people might not even realise they had it until it was too late. And by not having it until it was too late, it would mean that you could easily infect others. He warns that there could be millions of people who might die as a result of this, although perhaps he exaggerated this, maybe. But bear in mind, this was way back in 2015, when nobody knew what was coming. He got on, he basically stood up, and told people all about this. He showed a computer model of what would happen. He explained that while Ebola was generally um, limited just to the region, certain regions in Africa, um, the next crisis he believed would be worldwide because he stated that it would happen using some sort of flu, um, as, I just, as I just said, and if people would transmit it to each other without realising it, go abroad and um, infect other countries. And he felt this would happen all over the world. He said, however, the main problem was not the illness itself, but that governments weren't preparing for it. He claimed that governments and organisations were not doing anywhere in enough to try and prevent such a catastrophe from happening or if it did happen from limiting um, the pro you know the problems associated with it okay um, way back in 2015 most people probably thought it was a crackpot they probably thought he didn't know what he was talking about and basically was just generally ignored over this um, now apparently he is doing interviews saying something along the lines of I told you so. He's not used those exact words, but, but he has stated that he is very disappointed, personally, that um, a lot more wasn't done when earlier on, when it could have been done, after he had warned people about it. Okay? So, who is this guy? Who was the person who foresaw everything in 2015? And does anybody even believe he did? Well. USA Today did an article about this where they looked at the talk he gave in 2015 and they came to the conclusion that yes he did in fact personally predict the coronavirus in 2015 and tried to tell the world about it but unfortunately the world just didn't really want to know so what who is this guy well Basically, the guy himself is world famous. He is known internationally, um, and both is fa both famous and infamous for various reasons. Okay, um, he's infamous because several years ago, um, the government didn't like in America didn't like what he was doing um, regarding business practices and felt he wasn't doing enough to help competitors of a product um, that a company he owned um, was actually, or cr at least he created, I don't know about if he still owned it fully at that time, but I know he set it up, okay? A company that he set up and that at the time he was in charge of and um, was doing, okay? The government felt he wasn't being kind enough to competitors of his product, which sounds bizarre, but that's the way it was, okay? And so fast forward a few years, um, he and his wife um, set up a foundation to, among other things, try and rid the world of malaria and other philanthropic, I can't pronounce the word, <laughs> philanthropic, philanthropy, Oh, it's, anyway, to do philanthropy, I really can't pronounce it. I'm sorry, I know I'm, I'm incompetent. There you go. Right? So, um, something, it was, so basically, he set up a, 
a foundation which would try and save the world and do good things for the world, okay? Um, partly, I think, to overcome the fact he wasn't particularly pop popular up until this point because um, a lot of the products that he, his company released didn't actually work properly and people didn't really like it very much. But that's another matter, right? Now, in 2005, he was given a knighthood by an honorary knighthood because he couldn't have a normal one because he wasn't British, but he was given an honorary knighthood by the United Kingdom Queen of England, the Queen of, uh, no, she's the Queen of the whole of the United Kingdom, sorry. So he was given a, a knighthood by the um, Queen of the United Kingdom, okay, um, for services to charity through his foundation and for services to business okay and so um, that's the sort of level that he was at okay now in recent weeks he has quit the company that he set up to spend all his spare time to on the on the good causes that he wants to um, work on with his foundation, okay? Because he believes that saving the world now is probably more important than making money for his bit for the business he set up, as he thinks now it can be done better by an Indian. Because, as you're possibly aware, there's in certain industries there's been a lot of outsourcing to Indians, and. For what and it's you know and so Indians have been taking over um, Western people in certain sectors and in his particular sector even though he set up the company he has been replaced by an Indian okay but never mind you know you don't think and in America when he set up the company I don't think he ever thought he would ever be replaced by an Indian but there you go even if you own the company even if you set up the company even if you're in charge of the company, it still doesn't stop mean that you will never be replaced by an Indian if you're a Western per person, okay? Western white person, okay? Right? And I mean a real Indian actually from India, okay? But that's another matter altogether, guys, and nothing to do with all this. But it's just a few clues to give you an indication of who it might be, okay? But as I said, the main problem is, is that people didn't listen to him, and that nobody wanted to listen to him at the time. They just thought he was probably some sort of nutter. But he predicted all this way back in 2015. Now, he is apparently doing lots of chat shows um, and talking about how he was right and how much better the world would have been if only they had listened to him years ago when he warned them. Okay? So who is this guy? Well, um, if YouTube will let me, I will, in a moment, I will show you some clips from the talk he gave to the world, okay? And if I have to censor it, you'll know it's YouTube's fault, and then I'll have to provide links, as, okay? I'm also provide, I am definitely providing links to the chats below, so that you can see them yourself. But please, um, try to um, watch what I've done first and see if you could guess who you thought told the world about the coronavirus in 2015 before it even happened. Now I'm going to give you 10 seconds approximately to think about who you think it might be. Then I'm going to sh now I'm going to show you a clip if YouTube will let me, featuring the person actually at the talk, trying to tell the world about the doom that they're about to witness. Thanks for watching, guys. I'm going to disappear now, and if YouTube will let me, I will hand over to the guy who um, tried to tell the whole world about it. Okay, right. I'm going to give you 10 seconds now to guess who you think it might be, then I will disappear. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5.
five, four, three, two, one. When I was a kid, the disaster we worried about most was a nuclear war. That's why we had a barrel like this down in our basement, filled with cans of food and water. When the nuclear attack came, we were supposed to go downstairs, hunker down, and eat out of that barrel. <laughs> Today, the greatest risk of global catastrophe doesn't look like this. Instead, it looks like this. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. Not missiles, but microbes. But we've actually invested very little in a system to stop an epidemic. We're not ready for the next epidemic. Now, we could have taken the blood of survivors, processed it, and put that plasma back in people to protect them. Uh, but that was never tried. Now, in the movies, it's quite different. There's a group of handsome epidemiologists <laughs> ready to go. They move in, they save the day, but that's just pure Hollywood. The failure to prepare could allow the next epidemic to be dramatically more devastating than Ebola. Let's look at the progression of Ebola over this year. About 10,000 people died, and nearly all were in the three West African countries. There's three reasons why it didn't spread more. The first is there was a lot of heroic work by the health workers. They found the people and they prevented more infections. The second is the nature of the virus. Ebola does not spread through the air. And by the time you're contagious, most people are so sick that they're bedridden. Third, it didn't get into many urban areas, and that was just luck. Uh, if it had gotten into a lot more urban areas, uh, the case numbers would have been much larger. So next time, we might not be so lucky. Uh, you can have a virus where people feel well enough while they're infectious that they get on a plane or they go to a market. The source of the virus could be a natural epidemic like Ebola, or it could be bioterrorism. And so there are things that would literally make things a thousand times worse. In fact, let's look at a model of a virus uh, spread through the air uh, like the Spanish flu uh, back in 1918. So here's what would happen. It would spread throughout the world very, very quickly. And you can see there's over 30 million people die from that epidemic. So this is a serious problem. We should be concerned. But in fact, we can build a really good response system. We have the benefits of all the science and technology that we talk about here. We've got cell phones to get information from the public and get information out to them. We have satellite maps where we can see where people are and where they're moving. We have advances in biology that should dramatically change the turnaround time to look at a pathogen and be able to make drugs and vaccines that fit for that uh, pathogen. So we can have tools, but those tools need to be put into an overall global health system, and we need preparedness. The best lessons, I think, on how to get prepared are, again, what we do for war. For soldiers, we have full-time uh, waiting to go. We have reserves that can scale us up to large numbers. A NATO has a mobile unit that can deploy very rapidly. NATO does a lot of war games to check, are people well-trained? Do they understand about fuel and logistics and the same radio frequencies? So they are absolutely ready to go. So those are the kinds of things we need to deal with an epidemic. Now, what are the key pieces? Uh, first is we need strong health systems in poor countries. Uh, that's where uh, mothers can give birth safely, kids can get all their vaccines, but also where we'll see the outbreak very early on. We need a medical reserve corps, lots of people who've got the training and background who are ready to go with the expertise. And then we need to pair those medical people with the military, taking advantage of the military's ability to move fast, do logistics and secure areas. We need to do simulations 
germ games, not war games, so that we see where the holes are. The last time a germ game was done in the United States was back in 2001, and it didn't go so well. So far, the score is germs one, people zero. Finally, we need lots of advanced R&D in areas of vaccines and diagnostics. There are some big breakthroughs, like the Dino-associated virus, that could work very, very quickly. Now, I don't have an exact budget for what this would cost, but I'm quite sure it's very modest compared to the potential harm. The World Bank estimates that if we have a worldwide flu epidemic, global wealth will go down by over three trillion dollars, and we'd have millions and millions of deaths. These investments offer significant benefits beyond just being ready for the epidemic.、Uh, the primary health care, the R&D, those things would reduce global health equity and make、uh, the world more just as well as more safe. So I think this should absolutely be a priority. There's no need to panic. We don't have to hoard cans of spaghetti or go down into the basement, but we need to get going because time is not on our side. In fact, if there's One positive thing that can come out of the Ebola epidemic is that it can serve as a early warning, a wake-up call to get ready. If we start now, we can be ready for the next epidemic. Thank you. What happened? Did did people listen to that warning at all? Basically, no.、Um, you know, I was hopeful that with the、um, Zika and Ebola and SARS and MERS, they all reminded us、uh, that, particularly in a world where people move around so much,、uh, you can get、uh, huge devastation. And so the talk was to say. Hey, we're not ready for the next pandemic, but in fact,、uh, there's advances in science that if we put resources against them, we can be ready. Sadly, very little was done. There were some things. The、uh, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation、uh, (CEPI) was funded by our foundation,、uh, Wellcome、uh, Trust, and a number of governments、um, to do some of the. Uh, platform vaccine work, but the in the area of diagnostics, antibodies, antivirals,、uh, basically doing the disease games that I talked about, where we'd simulate、uh, what needed to be done,、uh, we hardly did anything. And and so now here we have a respiratory virus、uh, that is sadly fulfilling、uh, some of the more negative predictions I made.